Um, all right, so we're going to just talk a little bit about the potential factors now that contribute towards renal failure, which if any of you have, I mean, had cats, you realize that that's uh, ultimately most of our cats end up dying with kidney, kidney failure at some stage. Uh, if you ask most veterinarians, they probably will tell you it's because of the very high protein intake and that the, you know, the kidneys struggle to manage that protein. I don't think there's any truth to that. Okay, the actual protein is managed more by the liver than it is by the kidneys. Obviously, the kidneys have to excrete the waste products that are associated with that. Um, but I don't think that is the primary cause. So what I'm going to try and just show you is a few potential, and, they, and I suspect that all of these are acting at the same time and contributing to kidney failure in different ways. We've mentioned, really mentioned a few of them. But in terms of renal failure, there are different types of renal failure or re renal issues that we see in um, captive cheetahs. Um, glomerular sclerosis. Um, the glomerulus is the sort of uh, part in which, if, which filters out uh, a lot of the urine in the initial part um, where the blood uh, vessels you know, transfer the urine or the, the fluid from the actual blood vessel into the actual glomerulus. And sclerosis is just fibrosis and scarring of those glomeruli. Um, it actually doesn't result in actual changes in the kidney function in cheetahs. Uh, but almost 99% of captive cheetahs have this lesion. Uh, in the, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it when uh, you know get to that section. Amyloidosis, uh, very uh, used to be a very common. Uh, I've actually haven't seen cases of amyloidosis uh, for quite some time. So that's amyloid, which is a type of protein that gets deposited in the kidney. Um, it used to be thought that it was associated with gastritis, but uh, Professor Mitchell's um, research has shown that there actually isn't association between the gastritis and uh, uh, amyloidosis. There are quite a few people who think that it might potentially be transmissible, like a prion-like disease, that, that um, animals can pass these uh, proton, uh, proteins in the actual feces and then infect other animals and they can develop amyloidosis. Um, I think in terms of the uh, epidemiology, there's no real evidence for that actually happening. We don't see these outbreaks of amyloidosis um, in spread from one animal to another. Another individual cat species that is highly affected by this is uh, the black-footed cat. They're very, actually very, very difficult to keep in captivity because a large number of them develop uh, renal amyloidosis and die at a very young age. There certainly is a, a genetic predisposition to amyloidosis um, in the cheetah in general, but probably even more so in the black-footed cat. Um, and then there are a number of, of other factors that probably play a role. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we get probably the most common lesion that causes actual kidney failure or is, is, is cortical fibrosis and medullary fibrosis. And those are usually fibrosis, as I said, can be due to um, certain hormones like aldosterone, but it also is in response to chronic inflammation. So you have chronic inflammation, as that kind of inflammation heals, um, it, it lays, you get a lot of fibrin um, laid down and, and uh, fibrosis taking place. And then one weird... Um, Abnormality that we see from time to time is um, oxalate nephrosis, and this is basically these oxalate calcium oxalate crystals that get deposited in the kidney uh, and cause massive damage uh, in the kidney and, and really severe acute kidney failure. These animals are often in very good condition and then develop um, acute kidney failure uh, and usually die in a short space of time. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, issue because in cats, uh, domestic cats, oxalate nephrosis, the, probably the most common cause for that is if uh, they drink ethylene glycol, which is found in antifreeze um, that we use in a car. Uh, those kind of um, liquids are probably the only thing that cats will actually literally drink. Um, they don't like many toxins and cats, you know, to toxicoses in cats are actually very, very rare. Um, because cats are very fussy about what they, they're not going to eat something that's necessarily with a dog, you know, rat poison, they don't care, you know, they'll eat it and they'll eat carbon mates and, and all kinds of other things uh, that lie around or get thrown around. So uh, very easy to poison a dog, cats are not so easy, but ethylene glycol, they'll often, you know, somebody's changing the, you know, cleaning out the radiator or something in a car and leaves a, a pool of it lying, uh, cats will lick that, and then basically deposits these crystals. Now there's no way that these cheetahs are ever exposed to this, so we rule that out, but 
<clears throat> why they developed this is quite interesting. We might discuss, we'll discuss that as well. Um, just to show, this was a study that I did with a, a colleague of mine um, look, doing renal ultrasound and basically on cheetahs, and we measured the actual different measurements on the, on the, on the kidneys. Um, and then in the study, we just plotted the length of the left uh, kidney in millimeters over there and looked at um, how it related to the serum creatinine well, serum creatinine is uh, creatinine the waste product, which you talked about, the breakdown product of creatine, but it's mainly used as a measure of kidney function in humans and, well, any spe most species. And what you could see here was there was an inverse correlation. So basically, the smaller the kidney, moving over to, the, um, to that side, uh, you see that there's actually an increase in serum creatinine, indicating that there's reduced kidney function. And it was quite striking to see this because these animals were anything from 3 to 15 years and we still get that significant uh, inverse correlation, which indicates basically to me that the damage that's, that, we, that is occurring in the kidney is happening from a very young age in cheetahs. Fibrosis, the, the reason why the kidney gets smaller is because of fibrosis, cortical fibrosis and medullary fibrosis. And so w what is happening is basically from, even from 2 years of age, these animals are getting some progressive kidney damage. It's, but it, it takes a whole lifetime again for it to manifest into full-blown kidney damage because you have to destroy about 75% of your kidney. I mean, you can take out one whole kidney uh, and take out another half a kidney, and only then uh, will you start to see some uh, actual clinical signs of kidney failure. Okay, So there's a lot of reserve in the kidneys, and you have to destroy 75% of the kidney before you actually are going to get to actual kidney failure. So by the time that they start presenting, not wanting to eat, starting to look listless, start vomiting, um, you know, and you take a blood sample and see a very, very high creatinine level, um, or when, if you use SDMA or anything else like that, it's, they're, they're at the end stage of this disease already. Okay? And then there's probably there's very little that you can do to try and keep them alive for much longer. Okay, but this just showed that that damage is starting early, which is quite nice if you measure the kidney. If I see a kidney that's sitting at about 70 to 75 um, millimeters in length, the left kidney, um, which is the easiest one to actually scan, then you, you're pretty much again sure that the kidney function is probably going to be normal, you know, so even if you measure the other parameters. Um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, these, con these feline alanine and tyrosine fermentation um, products and the fact that they are conjugated with glycine. And so one of the first theories that I have, we mentioned this already, was this uh, whole um, glycine conjugation and the problems when there isn't sufficient glycine around, you're going to get these acyl coenzyme A thioesters, which I said are highly reactive uh, compounds. They will cause massive damage change to, uh, to proteins. And so I think this probably is one of the major... This, as I said, takes place almost entirely in the kidney in cats, uh, whereas in rats, mice, humans, uh, it's split between the liver and the kidneys. Right? So um, the fact that it takes place almost entirely in the kidney is of significance, and I think it may be one of the reasons why we get chronic kidney damage because of a glycine deficiency uh, due to low collagen intake. Okay, so we don't need to go through too much of that um, as well. We also talked about the gastric and renal dopamine um, and the fact that some of those phenolic compounds actually suppress some of the enzymes which are responsible for the production of dopamine. Uh, I mentioned that dopamine is very important uh, to increase gastric motility, reduce the gastric ulceration, and mo modulate gastrointestinal secretions as well as blood flow. But what I didn't mention is the function of intrarenal dopamine. Okay, And here it regulates blood pressure it plays an important role in naturesis, which is excreting excess um, sodium, in the regulation of that renin and tensin aldosterone system, in the modulation of COX-2, which is uh, important, um, again, with blood flow in the actual uh, kidney, and then uh, modulation of prostaglandins. If you take uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and ones that are like aspirin, they will suppress uh, COX-2 production, and if you take very high doses for a long period of time, particularly if you're dehydrated, you can actually end up with kidney damage from, from aspirin. I mean, aspirin, if you take an overdose, is often going to cause stomach ulceration because, again, it will, because of its inhibition um, uh, of COX-1, uh, which is important for the uh, regulation of, of uh, mucus and stuff in the stomach. 
all right? But if you, uh, it, you know, it's also important with regards to kidney function. So renal dopamine, very, very important. Now, um, in humans, when you have diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, you get a you get damage to your kidneys as well. Um, I mean, I mean, a whole bunch of things happen long term. You can get reduced blood flow, to, you know, with necrosis of your legs and have to have amputate, you know, amputations. But you can also get damage to the kidney in what we call um, diabetic nephropathy. Now, nobody, the mechanism of how does the diabetes actually cause di di diabetic nephropathy uh, has really uh, is not known. Um, but this paper, this was published in 2015. Um, speculated that one of the main reasons why humans get diabetic nephropathy is because of impairment of the intrarenal dopamine system. The lesion that you get with diabetic nephropathy is glomerular sclerosis, and it's almost identical to the actual lesion that we see in cheetahs. All right? But cheetahs don't have diabetes. We know that for sure. Their blood glucose levels are absolutely normal, and their insulin response is absolutely normal. So, yeah, we've got um, them having exactly the same lesion as you would in, in a, a human, but they don't have the same syndrome. But they may have a very similar mechanism by which they get the renal uh, glomerular sclerosis. Um, and that, as I said, may have to do with the intrarenal dopamine. All right. So, uh, yes. Uh, it's very difficult. I mean, they've got some. So, I mean, that's why I think it's very difficult. They, they speculate around it. I mean, they, they're mainly uh, looking at cultured renal cells. In, you know, in order to be able to do some of these experiments. Um, or they've got to play, I mean, the, in rats will actually um, take samples directly from the kidney um, cells, but it's a, a, technically it's a very difficult thing to actually measure. And dopamine, like adrenaline and noradrenaline, I um, mean, the half-life of it is so quick, it gets metabolized very, very quickly. So you've got to, you know, you've got to get your samples, they've got to be f snap frozen in liquid nitrogen um, and then taken straight to the lab and then analyzed. It's a, it's a very technically different, difficult thing to actually um, you know, test or measure. Yeah. All right, so we've got the two possible causes. We, we, we've already um, mentioned the intrarenal dopamine, um, and then the, this one I mentioned as well, uh, the sodium deficiency in the diet, right, with the whole impact that that would have on the renin and tensin aldosterone system. So if they are sodium deficient, you're going to get more renin production, more angiotensin, um, and more aldosterone being produced which is pro-fibrotic. Um, chronic activation may result in hypertension. So this is quite an interesting one because we actually don't know what the normal blood pressures are in cheetahs. Um, I'm hoping to publish now this year one where we've compared, where we've used, used a oscillometric blood pressure measurement machine that can be attached onto the tail of a, of a cheetah. Uh, we tested it, uh, compared it, um, the readings we got from it versus direct arterial blood pressure measurements in anesthetized cheetahs. And um, the, the accuracy is very, very good. But uh, now we have to go on and actually start measuring, get cheetahs trained um, so that they'll tolerate a cuff on the tail and the base of the tail. We find the tail is by far the best area to place the actual cuff. And then we you know, measure their um, blood pressures over a very long period of time. Look at a whole bunch of different individuals, see how it changes over their lifetime, and try and get some normal values for actual blood pressure in cheetahs. If we anesthetize cheetahs, their blood pressures go through the roof. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to have a systolic blood pressure of over 200 millimeters of mercury. So, you know, humans would normally have a blood pressure of 120 over 80. That would be normal. Uh, hypertension is anything sort of over 140. Yeah, they're going over to 200. Okay. And it, it doesn't really matter what drug combination we really use. I mean, they, it does vary depending on the drug combination. But very often, the systolic pressures are over 180. So we really, is that because cheetahs have, you know, um, normal high blood pressure? I mean, normal high blood pressure, but uh, also, or, or we don't really know. I suspect that they have very similar blood pressures to us. You know, uh, that 120 over 80 would be normal in, in, in a cheetah. But renal failure itself is often associated with increases in blood pressure because of the way in which the kidney functions. It, it regulates your blood pressure um, by many, many different mechanisms. Um, so when you get kidney damage, often you end up with hypertension at the same time. Um, and sometimes it's the other way around. Hypertension itself can sometimes cause changes in the kidney as well. All right, so sodium deficiency, another possible cause. And then aldosterone, we talked a little bit about that. Um, Hyperaldosteronism um, due, due to a sodium deficiency um, has a whole bunch of different um, effects in the body. 
so there we've got potassium and magnesium loss. Okay, and we do see cases um, in uh, a lot of large fields occasionally will have this problem of um, very low uh, potassium. I had a tiger not so long ago that came in and just very collapsed. And the only thing that we really found um, was a very, very low potassium level. She'd been translocated from Guatemala to South Africa, um, and the whole stress of the translocation uh, had seemed to contribute towards that. But a very low potassium level, and then it was actually quite a challenge now to increase her, her potassium levels. But it can also be from uh, a lot of aldosterone production due to uh, sodium deficiency. Um, the aldosterone, you get activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which we see um, inhibition of the parasympathetic nervous system. That's going to you know, affect the, uh, the um, function of the gastrointestinal tract and various other the organs in the body. Dyslipidemia and obesity, uh, myocardial fibrosis and hypertrophy, so a whole bunch of things. Um, that aldosterone is going to negatively impact if it's around uh, all the time. So basically, in terms of how do we prevent um, renal failure or reduce the risk or at least you know delay it for as long as possible, um, and you'll see that many many of these are very similar to the recommendations that we would have for uh, chronic gastritis. So feed high collagen diets. We're going to provide sufficient glycine that way. Um, we want to also uh, add the glycine, obviously, if it's necessary. No more than 50% muscle meat in the diet. Um, and then, uh, because that again is going to reduce the amount of uh, gastritis, which then also would reduce the amount of the, or increase the amount of dopamine that's available because you won't get that inhibition taking place. And then add sodium chloride if the animal is exsanguinated. If you're not feeding blood rich organs or blood, uh, leaving the blood in the actual carcass, then add two and a half grams per kilogram of meat fed um, sodium chloride. And I don't think it matters really much, very much whether it's iodated or non-iodated. I, I think, you know, we, we've been using iodated uh, sea salt um, for a long period of time, and it doesn't seem to make any difference uh, in terms of, we don't see iodine toxicity or anything like that. I think they, they could do with the extra iodine as well. Um, that's, that's in the, so that's not too much of a problem. Okay. All right. So, I mean, other than that, I don't really have, uh, we still have to test to see whether or not this does actually increase the, uh, I'm pretty certain that we will be able to push cheetahs certainly to 20 years of age in captivity. Um, you know, if we feed them correctly from day one, um, that the longevity of those cats will significantly increase and then hopefully the reproductive life of those animals as well. Um, most, you know, captive cheetahs are only reproducing maximum sort of uh, on average eight you know, eight or nine years um, of age, so that means a reproductive life really of, of about seven years. Um, if you breed them early, which is what you should be doing, um, the reproduction is certainly enhanced by early breeding. If you delay the, the onset of reproduction, you know, four or five years, you really start getting uterine pathology, and those cats often end up um, not breeding at all. Right? Whereas if you breed them very, very young, uh, they they keep going, okay, and they breed very very well after that. If you're going to breed them in captivity, um, yeah, but I think that we could push that reproduction, you know, well to beyond 12 or 13 years. Those animals, there's no reason why they can't reproduce at that age as well.